And it came to pass on the second Sabbath, after the first, that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Jesus, answering them, said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did, when himself was anhungered, and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the shewbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And he said unto them, that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts, and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up, and stand forth in the midst. And he arose, and stood forth. Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good, or to do evil, to save life, or to destroy it? And, looking around about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored, whole as the other. And they were filled with madness, and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. Thanks, Derek. Um, I guess the dominant theme of this passage is Sabbath observance, true and false. Sabbath observance, true and false. And false. We've read 12 verses together, uh, and under that heading of Sabbath observance, true and false, verses 1 to 5 would perhaps speak to us of working on the Sabbath, verses 6 to 10 of a healing on the Sabbath, and then verses 11 and 12 of the outcome. And we will look at the working on the Sabbath first, of course, verses 1 through 5, and that we might easily divide into the situation the accusation and the explanation. Before, however, we get into that and look at it closely, I must make perhaps a prefatory remark. The Sabbath he has spoken of was a Jewish ritual celebrated, as it still is, Friday night or Friday evening through Saturday evening. So for the most part, it was a Saturday. And I personally do not believe that this was intended to be nor has been carried over into the church though many in the past and at the present would say that it was converted into the Lord's day now I haven't got time tonight it doesn't seem appropriate in the light of the verses before us to look at that view tonight but uh, if you want to uh, find out what I think about that for what it's worth John Hewitt gave a message about a year ago here on the subject of the Sabbath and almost everything he said I think on that occasion was pretty much my view so if you wanted to find out what I think about the Sabbath and what I believe the Bible teaches about the Sabbath John Hewitt as I say can be found on our website about a year ago I would say having said that there is nevertheless a lot of profit for us in this passage even though the central theme is the uh, concerning the Jewish Sabbath so we look then first at verses 1 through 5, working on the Sabbath. The situation, the accusation, and the explanation. The situation is in verse 1. It came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first 
But he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. Now this was permitted under the law, if you want to look with me, to Deuteronomy. That's the fifth book, of course, in the books of Moses, the fifth book, Deuteronomy chapter 23. And verse 25, Deuteronomy 23, verse 25, When thou comest into the standing corn of thy neighbour, then thou mayest pluck the ears with thy hand, with thine hand, but thou shalt not move a sickle unto thy neighbour's standing corn. So what the disciples were doing in and of itself uh, was not unlawful. So that's the situation. Then comes the accusation in verse 2. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do you why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? So again we find the Sabbath uh, the, the Pharisees watching as ever, as we saw in chapter five when they uh, found fault with their feasting and found fault with their fasting and asking, Why do your disciples do this and why do your disciples do that? We find them watching again here. And someone has suggested that they may have, been, may have been following the Lord to see if he exceeded the prescribed distance of a Sabbath day's journey. That's just a suggestion, but not an unlikely one, it would seem to me. Now, their beef, as we say, is not with the disciples eating corn, but with their doing so on the Sabbath. What we've read in Deuteronomy makes it clear that there was nothing illegal or unlawful about eating corn, but their gripe was that they were doing this on the sabbath and they say there in verse 2 why do you that which is not lawful to do uh, on the sabbath days and the question we have to ask is according to who does the bible say it's not wrong it, that it is wrong to eat uh, in this way on the sabbath day well according to rabbinic and pharisaical traditions which they had added to the law it was unlawful but not according to the law of god the Pharisees, the Pharisees had developed stringent and picky definitions of what it meant to labour on the Sabbath. Servile labour was not permitted, and they'd gone to great lengths over the years, the rabbis, and no doubt the Pharisees too, to make these stringent and picky definitions about what a man might and might not do on the Sabbath, what actually constituted work and what didn't. And according to those man-made traditions, plucking and eating corn was work. And as such, that was a violation of the Sabbath. Now in another place, the Lord Jesus rebukes them for, for such kinds of addition. If you'd look with me for a moment to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. Verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying... Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honour thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, it let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honour not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. And also down in verse 9, the Lord says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And so just as we read there in Matthew, how they added to the commandments, so they did with regard to the Sabbath. So that's the situation in verse 1 and the accusation in verse 2. And then we come to the explanation in verses 3 to, through to verse 5. Now the Pharisees had challenged uh, the disciples in this account. The certain of the Pharisees said unto them, that is unto the disciples, why do you that which is not lawful? So they challenged the disciples, but the Lord Jesus himself answers for them. In a, place, in a certain place in the Bible, I think it's perhaps in the book of the Revelation, the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. 
And the Pharisees we find constantly accusing the disciples are evidently the devil's mouthpieces. And the Lord Jesus here on behalf of the disciples becomes their advocate and comes to their defence. John in his first letter tells us that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And just as we find him in the Gospels constantly rising to the defence of his disciples, so will he defend us. And so he says to them in verse 3, Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this? Now you remember when when Satan tempted the Lord in the beginning of his ministry, the Lord replied every time with, It is written, it is written, it is written. He came back at the devil with, It is written. And so here the servants of the devil, whom the Pharisees are, he says to them, Have ye not read? He takes them back to the word of God again. Um, and this teaches us also that we should learn to use scripture authority in every point, both in religious controversy and indeed with atheists and other unbelievers. So the Lord says, Have you not read so much as this what David did? Now I've mentioned before here and, and touched on it before at length that there is a certain foolish female professor at Exeter University and I don't suppose for a minute she's on her own who says there was no such person as David and uh, I've been astonished lately as I've mentioned to you at the, at the unbelievable ignorance uh, with regard to uh, Jewish history with regard to biblical history that prevails in the land these days of course coming out of the universities and such foolish people as this particular woman whom I won't name at Exeter University Um, she assures everybody that David never existed tells her students her unfortunate students who are paying to be deceived uh, that David never existed now it would be pointless for the Lord to point for an explanation in this case to an incident which never happened that would be silly to to, to point them back to something that had not happened and therefore she blasphemously and indirectly impugns the saviour himself Reading on then, have you not read so much as this, what David did when he himself, I'm sorry, when himself was unhungered, and they which were with him, he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. Now this history to which the Lord referring here is in 1 Samuel chapter 21, so we'll need to go back there. 1 Samuel chapter 21. And we'll read just a few verses here. 1 Samuel chapter 21, reading at verse 1, Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid of the meeting of David, and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? I'll just pause there for a moment, and just remind you that David is being pursued by Saul. Saul is the king in Israel at this time, and he's persecuting David, and David has had to flee. Verse 2, And David said unto Himelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabouts I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. And the priest answered David, and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said on him, Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it was sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of David who was there detained before the Lord and his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. So this is the account that the Lord is referring to, uh, pointing out to the priest that David took the bread, which was um, only for the priests. That bread was only to be eaten by the priests. And yet the Lord is defending uh, David here. And in so many ways, this is a, a powerful rebuttal of the Pharisees. First of all, we should notice the striking similarities between David's circumstance uh, and the Lord's. 
David at that time is being persecuted as I've mentioned by King Saul and the Lord Jesus is here being persecuted and hounded by the leaders in Israel because there was no king in Israel at this time other than the Lord himself who was not yet received as such the leaders in Israel were the Pharisees and they were persecuting the Lord just as David was being persecuted by Saul David at that time and that story had already been anointed as king but hadn't begun to reign and the Lord Jesus has been anointed here by the Holy Ghost and neither has he yet begun to reign David's friends were hungry and uh, the disciples were hungry it also appears that David's situation uh, was, on, was also on the Sabbath look with me at verse 6 again in 1 Samuel chapter 21 verse 6 if you've still got your finger in there so the priest gave him hallowed bread for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away um, the bread was changed the showbread was changed every Sabbath if you look with me if you can keep your finger in all these places come to Leviticus 24 because we're going to come back to uh, 1 Samuel Leviticus 24 which is the book that has to do with priestly service and the offerings and so forth Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 5 and thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof two tenth deal shall be in one cake and thou shalt set them in two rows six on a row upon the pure table before the Lord and they shall put pure frankincense upon each row that it may be on the bread for a memorial even an offering made by fire unto the Lord every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant so that bread was changed every Sabbath and the priest it says in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 21 the priest gave him hallowed bread for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away so hot bread had gone in the showbread the, the bread that had been there since the last Sabbath was taken out so that would suggest this was the Sabbath furthermore um, in verse 7 we read of a man called Doeg an Edomite now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord and his name was Doeg an Edomite and the commentators have suggested that he was detained there because he could not travel back it was too far to travel on the Sabbath that's perhaps speculative but not too much of a stretch I don't think and furthermore the fact that this might have been the Sabbath would give additional force to the Lord's argument because after all it was the Sabbath that they were complaining about um, and the Lord says of the showbread here in verse 4 which is not lawful to eat but for the priests alone William Taylor who was a preacher in New York in the last century wrote this where two obligations come apparently into collision the lower must give place to the higher and that there is nothing in the sight of God more sacred than the saving of life or the help of suffering humanity another commentator says the, sa the Sabbath was never intended to prevent works of necessity and another one perhaps the most powerful of all says any fulfilling of the law which forgets love commits a wrong love is the royal law all God's commandments call for nothing else but love and that's of course consistent with New Testament teaching for us in uh, the letter to the Romans chapter 13 verse 10 Paul says love is the fulfilling of the law in Matthew's gospel uh, in with regard to this same account the Lord adds another argument that Luke doesn't record if you go to Matthew 12 Matthew 12 the Lord makes another point about this which we don't find in Luke it's verse 5 of Matthew 12 he says or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless let's look for a moment at Numbers 29 Numbers 29 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, verse tw chapter 29 and verse 32. And on the seventh day, that would be the seventh day, seven bullocks, two rams, and fourteen lambs of the first year without blemish. In other words, these offerings were to be made on the Sabbath. And this is what the Lord is talking about when he says in Matthew 12, 5, Have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the, pro the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath? They work, in other words, and are blameless. And the rabbis themselves taught as much, um, according to Matthew Paul, uh, the, the, the Jews had a saying that in the temple there was no Sabbath and I would say and I would just interject here that the same is true of those who are in Christ Matthew's account gives a little more detail than Luke um, again just, just keeping in Matthew 12 for a moment and reading on in verse 6 but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple but if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So the Lord says in this place is one greater than the temple. So in walking with Jesus then and serving him is a service greater than the temple service, which the rabbis admitted there was no Sabbath in the temple. Um, one man has commented in him yet more in him yet more than in the temple the father's glory dwells now if as the rabbis taught there is no sabbath in the temple which is only a shadow of christ because all the things of the law the services they were a shadow of things to come and if as the rabbis taught there was no sabbath in the temple then in christ the service being the same every day for a believer a special day seems to me to become moot if I'm serving the Lord today, Wednesday, what more can I do on Sunday? If I'm walking with the Lord today, and this is my principal objection about much that's taught on the Lord's Day and the so-called Sabbath, if I'm walking with the Lord obediently today, what more can I do on Sunday? What more can you do on Sunday? And I think too often, too many things have been tacked on uh, by Christians and by preachers, particularly the Reform School, that are not really warranted by the word of God, just as the Pharisees tacked them on. The true Sabbath breakers were those who would sacrifice man, as it were, to save the Sabbath, and we'll see more about that when we get into the second section. The Lord says in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27, again the same incident, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Pharisees, like their modern counterparts, had made the Sabbath an instrument of suffering instead of relief so we move on to the next section verses 6 to 10 we've looked at working on the sabbath this next section verses 6 to 10 teaches us about healing on the sabbath and so much of course of what we said about working on the sabbath applies in this account as well and this account really reveals to us how much sabbath keeping pharisees would let men suffer Again, we find again here in this second section the situation, the accusation, and the explanation. And I'll deal with these more briefly. The situation is in verse 6 then. And it came to pass, we're in Luke 6, verse 6. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. I notice that it's the Sabbath once more. It came to pass also on another Sabbath. So that's the situation then comes the accusation in verse 7 and the scribes and pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him now they don't in in this account uh, they just watch him in matthew's account they actually ask the question and it seems that they viewed it seems clear that they viewed healing a man as servile labor which ought not to be done on the Sabbath, otherwise why would they have complained of it? And yet the extraordinary thing is the Lord's healings, as they themselves knew, could hardly be called servile labour. He simply spoke. Most of the time he would simply speak, as was the case here, and men were healed. So quite, I mean, this just goes to show really how foolish and how strict and picky were the additions they made to the law. Have a look at John's Gospel, chapter 5, for a moment. Verse 
John's Gospel in chapter 5. And verse 16. This is the chapter 5 is about the man that lay by the pool of Bethesda and he'd been infirm and unable to move it seems for 38 years and the Lord heals him and in verse 16 of John 5 and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day it healed a man who'd been hardly able to move so far as we can gather for 38 years and somehow they and, and again he simply speaks what did he say to the impotent man uh, in verse 8 Jesus saith unto him rise take up thy bed and walk and immediately the man was made whole and somehow this is construed to be servile labour on the Sabbath day and we find in verse 16 of John 5 therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day we find something similar in John's Gospel chapter 9 John's Gospel chapter 9 and verse 14 this is the blind man this story is a fantastic story I say I shouldn't use the word fantastic it means of the nature of a fantasy a wonderful story shall we say in John 9 of a man who was blind from birth congenital blindness and uh, he gets healed and look at verse 14 of chapter 9 and it was on it was a sabbath day when jesus made the clay and opened his eyes then again the pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight he said unto them he put clay upon mine eyes and i watched and do see therefore said some of the pharisees this man is not of god because he keepeth not the sabbath day others said how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles and there was a division among them so here's the man and it's occurred to me this evening as I was making I think it was this evening as I was making these final notes this this man had sat uh, where he'd sat presumably presumably for years and no doubt they had seen him themselves these Pharisees or perhaps they hadn't perhaps they were so callous and so hardened they never noticed suffering people sitting begging as he had done they might have recognised him no doubt if they'd ever paid him any attention in the past but maybe that's a bit speculative but such callousness towards men is shocking to behold from men who were professing to be the servants of God it makes me smile when I hear atheists and, and I've been told um, that I've been conned by uh, religion that it's something that the government uses to control men the problem is they don't know the difference between the kind of religion that the Pharisees are involved in and the kind of faith that the Lord Jesus taught. Maybe, maybe to some degree. I mean, the Pharisees were interested, no doubt, in, in keeping up appearances in Israel, perhaps, and they had a care, maybe, for the traditions of Israel. They certainly did. Um, and maybe, you know, it was true of them to some extent. But to put them together with the Lord Jesus is about as ignorant as you can be what use we have to ask was this pharisaical religion what use was it it was certainly unacceptable to God and it did nothing for men except lay burdens upon them the only purpose it seems to serve was to promote the Pharisees themselves let's have a look at Matthew 23 where I think this is what exactly what the Saviour teaches us Matthew 23 Uh, verse 1 then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples saying the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses seat all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe that observe and do but do not ye after their works for they say and do not for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers but all their works they do for to be seen of men they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men rabbi rabbi 
So there's the accusation. Next comes the explanation, verses 8 through 11. Let's read verse 8. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. I think it was John Phillips who comments that the Lord intended to make his response as public as possible. Knowing their thoughts, he's not only going to heal this man, but he's going to expose the hardness of their hearts with powerful teaching. His question in verse 9 could hardly have been more searching. Read verse 9, Then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? You know, some people say there was no such man as Jesus. I mean, the barminess just, comes, just keeps coming, doesn't it? There was no such man as Jesus. And I've always believed for a long time it would take a Jesus to invent a Jesus. You find so often, just he speaks and that's an end of it. There's no, there's no comeback. There's nothing anybody can say. It's just perfect, simple, straightforward answers. And so it would take a Jesus to invent a Jesus. It would take a man of this kind of quality to say things of this kind of quality. There's nothing imaginary about Jesus Christ at all. Then said Jesus to them, I will ask you one thing, is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? Um, now Mark adds in his account, but they held their peace. Uh, at times without number the Lord silenced his gainsayers with just a word so often. Uh, you know one could think of many occasions one of, the, one of the most beautiful occasions where when he's teaching in the temple it's in John 8 and they bring a woman taken in adultery and they all come in you know no doubt all looking very imposing in their robes and their phylacteries and all the rest of it and they drag this woman they throw her in the midst and uh, we're not told how many of them there were so you get the impression there were several of them and he just speaks a few words and it's all over <laughs> and they, again they can't answer and the Lord Jesus told his disciples, didn't he? He said, when you come into judgment, don't think beforehand, don't plan beforehand what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words you need. And when the Holy Spirit does that, men have got no answer. And they could not answer here for shame. They could not answer for shame. And it's just so today that when the enemies of the truth are confronted, they hold their tongues, but they maintain their prejudice. They're crafty enough to keep their mouths shut, but they continue so often in their wickedness. Now in Matthew's account again, if you go back to Matthew 12, the Lord Jesus enlarges a little more on what we've just read in Luke 6. Matthew 12, the same situation, but we find that the Lord is, we give, we're given a little more detail in Matthew as to what the Lord went on to say. Let's read from verse 10 of Matthew 12. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if he fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Now this really ought to have convicted them of their hardness of heart and the unreasonableness of their form of Sabbath keeping. I fear that many Christian parents and especially pastors have lost their children to the world through excessive legality on what they call the Lord's Day. They won't let them play ball, they won't let them watch the television, they won't let them read them comic books. I mean that must be torture for a five, six, seven year old. And yet so often I hear stories of pastors and some of them, all of their children have gone off into the world. And I fear it's this kind of legalism, this kind of making little children follow stringent codes that God never gave in the first place as to how they should behave on a Sunday. I'm sure this was a problem that Andy Parks has had. Regrettably, he's not with us tonight or he could have told us more, but I'm pretty sure this is what drove his family were believers. His father was a believer and his mother I believe was a believer but things were so stringent in their home the children rebelled 
But then comes in verse 10 the miracle. And looking round, verse 10, and looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. You wonder what right they, that we find in a moment they go on to complain, and you wonder what right they had to complain. He had given them opportunity to speak, and they would not. So he heals the man. So what right have they got to, to, to complain at all? But they do. And in verses 11 and 12 we have the outcome. Verse 11 is the communion of the Pharisees, and verse 12 is the communion of the Lord. Verse 11, the communion of the Pharisees. Let's read that. Verse 11, and they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, religion can be a deadly business. As many an atheist, atheist loves to point out, the trouble is he doesn't know the difference between religion and biblical Christianity. Religion can be and is a deadly business. The Catholic Church, leave alone what's going on with the so-called jihadists at the moment and the Islamists, the Catholic Church is guilty of the slaughter of multiplied millions of Christians with their phony religion. Religion can turn men into monsters. To keep what they believe to be the will of God, they will ignore great suffering and inflict it. The Lord taught his disciples in John chapter 16 and verse 2, The time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. This was true of the Catholics in the Middle Ages, and it's true of the Islamists today. Mark tells us in his Gospel that after this healing, the Pharisees took counsel with the Herodians how they might destroy him. Uh, our text says they communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. So here's the Pharisees' communion. They're communing together with a view to killing the Lord. But there's a better communion in verse 12. It came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Communion with God is better than communion with men. Too often... Too often, sadly even in churches, the latter leads to strife, but the former always to joy and peace. Communion with God will bring joy and peace. So often, sadly, sadly even in churches, communion among men leads, leads to strife. It is a sad thing that Christians fall out so much. It's a sad thing that churches break up so much. If only we could learn to be gracious, if only we could learn to forgive, if only we could learn that we don't know everything, we might get along a little bit better. You meet young brethren sometimes, I meet young brethren sometimes, and they go at me like I've never read the Bible. They begin to teach me with authority, their eyes glaze over, they foam at the mouth, they begin to teach with me with authority like I haven't been reading the Bible for the last 40 years. And they've read it for five minutes and they think they know it all, and they cause tensions very often amongst believers. There's a great little book written many years ago, I think I've got it downstairs, by George Verber called Pseudo Discipleship in which he describes all kinds of people that you find in churches. And there's the fault finder, and there's a nitpicker, and there's a legalist, and on and on and on it goes, and there's a lazy man, and so on and so forth. And I've met many of these people over the years, and sadly, I'm sure so have you. But to conclude, and this is perhaps the, the, the central lesson, the challenge to me, and perhaps we need to take away with us, we need to be daily on our guard, lest misinterpreting the scriptures makes us hard and unfeeling. We must look to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to walk aloof from compromise on the one hand and legalism on the other. And only the Holy Ghost and the Word of God can keep us on that right road, that straight road, that walk of faith. So easy to, to avoid legalism, to become a compromiser and to say it's okay to do things which it's not okay to do. It's easy to knee-jerk from compromise and be far too strict and stringent. We need to be on our guard, lest in misinterpreting the scriptures we fall into either of those errors. And this is the path where the Lord walks and this is where He wants the Holy Spirit wants to lead us. So we'll leave it there tonight. Amen. Amen.